All right. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, actually, before I jump in, I wanted to, um, to also say a big thanks to Coldeep and the organizing team here today um, and over the last couple of days. The uh, interesting story for me is I actually came to Singapore the first time four or five years ago for the first UX conference in the region. And the event then was really important as a place to come and exchange ideas and to connect with people. And I think nothing has changed. It's still really, really important. So I think for my side, just a big thanks for hosting this and, and, and creating this, this space for us to exchange thoughts. So really important. So before I jump in, um, I'll talk today a little bit about, um, yeah, as we're talking about UX skills, both for today and for the future. Um, my intent for today is really to give you some food for thought. I don't have the answers, but I do have some questions that I would like to leave you with and, and that you can start to think about in the next coming weeks and months and years. So as highlighted, I'm currently working for uh, Siam Commercial Bank. So um, actually, it's the first bank started in Thailand. To my knowledge, it's 115 or 117 years old. And if you haven't guessed, it's the purple one. So if you're ever visiting Thailand, um, easy to recognize. There's a big green one, there's a big blue one, and there's a big purple one. Yeah. Um, previously, uh, just a quick intro, I uh, actually worked across a bunch of different domains. So a couple of banks in the UK, like HSBC and Lloyd's Banking Group. Um, more recently, I was actually working at Lazada um, in a regional role here um, in, in Vietnam, Thailand, and Singapore as well. So just want to do a quick uh, show of hands in the audience. So do we have anyone here, uh, maybe from a product owner, business analyst, product manager kind of background? A couple. How many here are more visual design or UI design? OK, a few more. And who is here in a UX design or interaction design type of role? All right, interesting. So of course, as we go through the conversation today, I think different things will apply to different people in different roles. Um, but it's great to, to get to know you. So I actually wanted to take a step back a little bit and, and say, okay, well, actually, where did our practice come from? What, what were the origins? And we saw a little bit yesterday already from one of our other speakers from DBS, too. So this here, um, one of the very early cockpits from a fighter plane. So actually, it's a, it's a plane from 1937, right? Pretty, how, how would you describe the interface? Would you say it's... Easy, simple, complex, overwhelming, somewhere in, in the middle. Mm -hmm. This here, can anyone guess what this might be? ATM, correct. The first ATM withdrawal in 1967, long before my time, um, was a big shift for, for a lot of the, uh, the banks, of course, at the time, right? And, and again, the automation process already started to happen back then. This third one we saw yesterday as well. So one of the first graphical user interfaces, right, the Xerox Alto and the Xerox Star, um, really pioneering devices from the 70s and 80s. Um, and you might be wondering why am I talking about these three pictures? Well, I think it's, it's sort of a bit about um, understanding our role as designers and UX professionals. So I love technology. I'm really passionate about technology. Um, but when I look back and I start to do a bit more research, I mean, you start to see that actually a lot of innovation, it's as much as we love design, maybe first and technology second in some cases, a lot of innovation is really driven by the tech, right? And design follows suit. So the reason I bring this up is um, design really originated and UX really started to originate in these three areas because there were some key business problems that needed to be solved, right? In the case of aviation, the training cost for getting a pilot capable of flying a plane were extraordinarily high, and today still are actually, extraordinarily high because of the safety implications, because of the complexity of the interface. On the other hand, on the consumer space with ATMs, getting people out of the habit of going into a branch and talking to a human and actually just self-servicing themselves with a machine Again, it's a behavioral challenge, and there's some usability complexities there. So getting that learning curve down, making it more accessible, more usable, makes business sense, right? And lastly, same with um, the graphical user interface. So in order to make computers accessible, that means moving away from command line interfaces and more towards graphical, easy-to-use devices. 
So I think there's, there's tons of people from different backgrounds in, in the field of UX. Um, and really, what I tend to see most commonly, but it's not an exclusive list, of course, is people either come from a technology, computer science side, maybe from a business analysis side, from an industrial product design side, or sometimes from psychology, right? Um, and that creates a really interesting place for us to practice and learn from different perspectives. But then how do we define UX design? Well, I think it, it depends on who you ask, right? It's a never-ending debate in our, in our industry. I think this is a, I love pyramids. If you ask anyone in my team, I really love a good pyramid. Um, this is a hierarchy of, of kind of design considerations. And what we'll see quite often is us designers, we love being at the top of that pyramid, right? We love the micro interactions. We love the attention to detail, the polish and everything else. Businesses are often a bit more towards the bottom of that pyramid. I think, you know, talking about the 80-20 rule this morning, um, the cost for businesses is probably more towards the bottom, but us as designers that are really passionate about our craft really love that top as well. But before I dive too deep into the never-ending debate about how we define our practice, I actually want to take a little bit of a sidestep and talk about something else that's been happening in our landscape uh, when it relates to jobs and skills. So I did a little bit of research um, and I think we're all pretty familiar with um, the media industry and the transformation it's gone through. But a quick, quick recap. So in the year 517, monks were doing a lot of hand transcribing of manuscripts and documents. And the information I found was that they could produce one impression per hour, which is roughly equivalent to one page per hour. So that's the volume that they could actually produce, right? Fast forward to the printing press. In 1439, we move up to 240 impressions per hour. Quite a, quite a dramatic uh, leap in terms of uh, production and information gathering. Then we come into mass production, mass, pu mass publishing. In the 1930s, 2,500 impressions per hour, up until 18,000 impressions per hour. So again, massive, massive leaps forward. But of course, I think we all know nothing compares to the power of the internet, which for all intents and purposes, we could say it's unlimited self-publishing power, right? You almost can't quantify it. But I tried, so did a little bit of digging. According to, to IDC, they're saying, okay, we're producing eight zettabytes of information every year now, um, which is just unfathomable. On the other side, I think we also know that the print revenues are not doing that great. Most of the publishers, traditional publishers, have been struggling, right? Their ad revenue is down. Even their online revenue is a fraction of what it used to be. So inevitably, there's a decline in the number of newspaper firms, right? I think we've all seen this happening in, in recent years. So what does, that, what does that mean? Why did that happen? Well, on one hand, technology creates this power to disrupt it removes the shackles and the limitations, right? Also, consumer behavior changed. Um, I, don't know, I don't know how it's here in Singapore, but if I look at my parents, my parents were the generation that would get their newsletter in paper form every week, read it back to front. Nowadays, I think the younger generations consume media in a different way, right? It's short articles, it's on the go, it's in your pocket. Slightly, slightly different. And clicks and traffic have become a new editor for us, right? Previously, editors in the newspaper industry had a lot of power, a lot of control. Now, as businesses need to seek revenues, the clicks, the traffic, become much more of a guiding force as well. So, what does that mean for the skills that were involved in, um, in that industry? And how did that change? Well, what happened to the monks? The monks that were publishing manuscripts back in the day, where did they go, right? Or what happened to the printing press operators, the machinists, the typesetters, where did they go? I uh, recently saw a documentary that there is one last operating typesetter in the US, basically a two-man shop, um, out of pure passion, not commercial enterprise. Yeah. 
And I think if, if any of us have maybe friends or family that work in the publishing industry, I think we'll also see journalists and photographers, their jobs have also changed over the years, right? Um, personally, I've got some friends that used to be photographers and other photographers and videographers and writers doing kind of all three, wearing three hats at a time. So it's undergone really, really rapid change. So back to the topic at hand. Why am I talking about the media industry and how does it relate to UX design? Well, we find ourselves somewhere along this curve of technological acceleration. Um, so I think, you know, starting with the printing press down here on the left side, moving into AI and all sorts of fancy, incredible stuff up there on the curve. I think sometimes for me, the industry feels like it's a bit slow and I wish, oh, well, we've been talking about AI for 10 years. Is it really great? Maybe, maybe not yet. But nonetheless, I think actually when you step, take a step back, the pace is much, much faster than it was in previous generations. So where does it leave us? A uh, little bit of digging again from my side in relation to specifically to UX and design. So the first web analytics, 1998, from what I can gather. Uh, of course, data, as we've been talking about in the last two days, qu both qualitative and quantitative play a big part of our toolkit. Um, and so, yeah, first web analytics, 1998. The first, the first A-B test that was thought to be conducted was by Google in 1999. So it's already been quite a while. And this is in no real sequence, but just for illustration purposes, we're just talking about design patterns and templates and multivariate testing. Again, lots of toolkits that are evolving very, very rapidly that directly impact the way we, we work as professionals. Templates and web frameworks, prototyping tools, artificial intelligence, and I think maybe in relation to the question just in the session earlier, there's a very interesting concept that's evolving called evolutionary A-B testing. There are actually some functioning tools like this. What it really means is in an A-B test, the human says, I want to test option A against option B and see which one performs best, right? With evolutionary A-B testing, the system decides, okay, let me run an experiment, change the color of a button, let me move a link around from left to right, let me change some other stuff. And it can do it on the fly, rapidly, in quick succession, without any human intervention. Which is, on one hand, super interesting and cool, because it can outpace us and be much faster and more innovative. But it's also weird, because then we're not in the driving seat, right? And what is the role of the UX designer, then, if it's, self, if it's basically self-conscious about what it wants to design and test? And what's next? You know, we're in 2018 now, in 2020, 28. 2038, what does the landscape look like? What do those tools look like? What does our practice look like, right? Going a little bit further yet. So today we have lots of wonderful tools available to us. So from Apple's human interface guidelines to material design and all sorts of other kind of pattern library uh, websites and tools. Fantastic resource. We've got our tools like Azure, Sketch, Adobe XD. They're rapidly evolving. Lots of new features, better workflows every month, every year that we go on. We've got prototyping, right? Framer or Envision or Principle. And of course, we've got developer handoff tools like Zeppelin and Avocode that are starting to move into this realm of design systems where we can integrate much more easily between development and design and UX. So again, what's really happening here? There are some tools that are basically aimed at conceptualization and helping people conceptualize new ideas, new solutions. And on the other hand, there's communication tools, right? How do we explain our artifacts to other people, product owners, developers, and so on. And of course, there are tools such as Envision that are actually starting to spread across this entire spectrum, which greatly, greatly impacts actually what we do. Um, wondering, any show of hands, who's used Squarespace or Wix or any of those kind of platforms? Quite a few people. How was your experience? Good, bad? Good? Raise your hand. Easy? 
Yeah, yeah, pretty easy. The, the, question, the question for me here is, when it comes to UX design, right, it's really about problem solving for a specific client in a specific moment in time, a specific problem, right? So something like Squarespace, does it solve the super bespoke needs of a large enterprise? Maybe not, maybe not yet. But does it, does it suffice for a small, independent little shop that wants to get their name out there, that wants to have a, a sort of a digital name card of sorts, um, that people can find them, get some basic information? I, I'd probably say yes. It's probably pretty damn good, and it's pretty cheap and, and effective, right? They don't need to rely on that many experts or, or build up a contract with an agency or a vendor or anything. They can just hop on, put in their credit card, do a free trial, drag some stuff around, publish, and it'll look look pretty good, right? Pretty good. It's not bespoke. So I think that leaves me to my next question, which is where do you work and what kind of organization do you work? If you work in a maybe a small startup or a small organization or an SME, your company may have different needs when it comes to UX and design than a large corporate um, that has very detailed, unique requirements. And what does your company actually look like? So I think this is um, just a simple illustration of a UX maturity model, right? So I think on the bottom, we've got basically UX is not recognized. It basically does not exist. All the way to the top, which is where we would all aspire to be. So it's embedded in the organization. Everyone's practicing it, breathing it up from CEO and senior management and so on. But again, the way that UX looks like in different organizations, it depends a bit on this, it depends on where you are. And I think this, um, just to illustrate as well, the structure of organizations and businesses and their maturity and their overall journey also shapes our practice. So what is this? This is just a basic illustration. I think when I think back to my time when I used to work in London, back in the early days of digital, digital teams, including UX and product owners, they really used to be this bolt-on on the outside of the company. Oh, we've got this digital team too. Yeah, they're sort of sat over there in the corner. We talk to them once in a while. That's, that's starting to change, right? So we were, we were sort of the outsider. Um, nowadays, thankfully, a lot of us work in organizations where digital is really front and center, either working in a tech startup or working for a larger traditional organization that has started to build the capabilities, the, the, the tools, the skill sets. So we have a seat at the table. In terms of our skill set though, what does that mean as well? So when I think about skill sets, I think in, in hard skills and soft skills. So hard skills being, okay, of course, the prototyping, the methodology, the research tools we use, our approach, etc. But we also have our soft skills, right? Depending on your organization, depending on your seniority, um, the mix of hard and soft actually becomes pretty important. Right? And it might actually shift balance as you progress in your career and as you change from different company to different company. So in some companies, it might look more like 50-50 and some it might look more like 80-20. Um. Uh, a little story um, from my, my last role with, uh, with Lazada and Alibaba. Actually, there's a few people here in the room in case you want to get an inside scoop. Um, so we had a, during the last, uh, last couple of uh, six months at my time at Lazada, we had a very interesting collaboration with, uh, with Alibaba on a very special technical project. The reason why it's quite interesting for me is, you know, I come from a background where I learned the kind of the textbook UX process, right? User-centered design from start to end. And then I, I run into Alibaba's process and it looks a bit different. Um, so I think organizational culture within Alibaba is really speed is everything. Speed is absolutely everything. So the mindset at Alibaba was a little bit, if I simplify, a little bit towards don't plan too much. Just start, start working, start designing, start building. We'll test and measure. And we'll do it so quickly that in two months we'll have tested 10 variations and we have a working function. It's a very different mindset than the classical UX approach. 
Does it work? It seems so. It seems so. Lastly, I've been speaking about design and UX in a, in a bit of a general sense, but of course, when it comes to skills, um, let, let's be specific, right? So we have user research, we have UX design, we have visual design, service design, you could say as well. Um, again, depending on which role you're in, um, you might have some different, different steps to take. So let's talk about defining our value, right? What role do we play? And how is that going to change? Well, again, where did we start? We started back there working on cockpits and automation, and machines, and making machines more accessible to the first graphical user interfaces to the iPhone. That's the past 30, 40 years. Right now, we're somewhere closer towards this space. All right, most of our bread and butter is still in web and apps but we're getting closer and closer to voice, to augmented reality, to virtual reality. Which also begs the question, right, if we're today spending a lot of time doing research, but also, I think let's face it, we spend a lot of time doing wireframes, prototypes, testing those. What does that look like in a voice world? What does that look like in an augmented reality world? What does it look like in a driverless car world where there may still be UX requirements, but the output is something completely different. There is a fantastic concept out there. Um, Mark Weiser in, 19, in the 1970s, sort of the grandfather of ubiquitous computing, I would highly encourage you to look it up and do some reading. It's very, very fascinating stuff. The way that he talks about ubiquitous computing is is sort of, it's his philosophy, I don't know if it really applies to everyone or, or, or if it's a universal value, but he says, technology is at its best when it disappears into the fabric of our everyday lives. Right, which kind of suggests that more buttons, more devices isn't necessarily what people really want. But people just want to get their stuff done more easily, more quickly, more conveniently. And today that looks like more devices, more buttons, more screens, but 10 years later, 20 years later, is that still the case? We'll have to see. Next, so we talked about voice, we talked about AR, tangible user interfaces, or TUI is also quite interesting. We're starting to see more experimentation like this in, in, in real world applications today. I believe LG and Google have released a phone where you can squeeze the sides to perform a certain gesture or action. Um, but more I want to focus on the concept of bounded re rationality which is basically a fancy psychologist way to say what we know is limited by what we know. Therefore, the predictions we try to make are, of course, never going to encompass every option and every possibility. So, because we've been talking about chatbots a little bit too, I thought, okay, maybe let me, let me, let me make a little bit of an experiment. Let me see if I can build a little chatbot for this session. So I'm hoping the internet still works and we can do a little bit of a play. All right, let's, let's give this a go. Let's get started. So what is your job? We've got a couple of options here. Um, I'll, I'll go with visual designer. I'm feeling, I'm feeling lucky. How long have I been working as a visual designer? What shall we say? Let me scan it. Let's say, let's say one to three. Yes, that sounds about right. Okay. Okay, that went a bit fast. So, just before you get too impressed, how long do you think this took to put together? Between, let's say between, anyone think more than 10 hours? No? Five? One. This is not the only scenario, there are more. So actually, this is the beauty of technology, right? It makes 
tools and frameworks so accessible that you can rapidly jump in and experiment and play around. So there are some great platforms. You can either hand code it from scratch, of course, or you can jump in, use a platform, and do this in just one or two hours pretty easily with multiple scenarios, personalized responses, not full AI, but you can actually script quite a lot and do, yeah, get pretty far. So back to our topic at hand. Where we should take our aim. I think the one, the one guiding principle I want to leave you with is follow the money, right? Today our money is the bread and butter, mobile apps and web, right? That's where businesses really um, monetize, right? Voice and all the other stuff is still on the fringes today, but, but really follow it, right? So one, two years later, five years later, 10 years later, is it still web and apps? Or is it something totally different? Depending on what the answer is, we may need to retrain our focus and our skills to move towards those areas. The better you can anticipate those things, more likely you're going to be highly relevant and sought after in the market. Also think a little bit about the stage that your company is at. So are they investing in design and technology? Are they increasing cross-department collaboration? Are they engaging in culture change? Those are the types of questions that will also tell you more about the trajectory of your current company. Just earlier, um, during lunch, we were discussing with some some fellow colleagues and friends and saying, well, what's happening to the big tech giants? What's happening to Facebook? Is it still going to be relevant five years later? It seems like they're losing quite a lot of their population and their, their active audience from Facebook moving into Instagram. But we've been here before, right? So there was a MySpace in the 1990s. It was huge, absolutely huge, and it totally vanished, right? That could still happen. We talked yesterday uh, with a couple of people around uh, the notion of T-shaped professionals, T-shaped skill sets. Um, I think very, very relevant. So I think, this is, I think this is, for me, one of the key messages I would like to share with you today is really think about where you put your skills today. What's an expertise and what's a universally transferable skill, right? I think the realm of where we work, the companies we work in are changing rapidly. Um, but so are the, the, so is the education and our role in society, right? In my parents' generation, and probably in all of our parents' generation, there was that notion of, okay, you go to university, you do a bachelor's, you do a master's, you move into a company, you work for 20, 30, 40 years, you retire and, right, you enjoy your lifestyle. Today we're moving towards online education, training courses that are much more free and accessible, but likewise, the notion of needing to retrain and top up your education every decade or so is becoming more of an expected um, outcome in the next couple of generations. So again, what's a domain transferable skill and what's a, what's a UX specialist skill? So on the practical side, because I don't want to make it too, too abstract, I think irrespective of your exact title and organization that you're in, I think you would do very well to kind of dab start dabbling a bit deeper in strategy and business, right? Really understand the business model that you're serving, because ultimately that's why we're there as UX professionals, to solve problems. Solve problems for the customer so that the business can make money, right? So if you don't understand the business model, you might be in a bit of trouble later on. But likewise, to be able to talk to the business, you need those soft skills, but you also need data. Right. Data is our tool, data is our weapon to say, hey, this isn't just about objective, subjective opinions, this is actually what we found either through user testing, through analytics, A-B testing, this is what we found, therefore let's have an informed discussion. So I think in a, in a nutshell, I think the closer we can get to problem solving, right, and the more we can become experts in a couple of different of these areas, I think the more, the more powerful you be in your both in your current role today as well as in the future future world of tomorrow, where wireframes and prototypes may be less important. So, I think I think it's been a while since we've had a discussion about unicorns and what it means to be a unicorn in our industry, but the point I'd like to share is. Um, 
Am I saying that we all need to become unicorns and be a kind of a jack of all trades as per the previous slide? Absolutely not. But what I do think is this. As the tools of our trade evolve and become more powerful with prototyping, collaboration, and all the other stuff, it actually it frees us up in a way, right? And allows us to do more. Now you could either say, well, okay, that means we do more wireframes and more prototyping. Or you could go a bit wider and say, well, actually, maybe I learn a bit about data. I learn a bit about testing. I learn a bit about strategy or product management to make me a more capable problem solver for the business. So I think that's the direction that I would encourage everyone to go in. Use those tools and those advances to give you more power, more firepower. So back to the, the media industry that we looked at earlier, right? Someone that was a journalist but wouldn't pick up a camera, I think today has a tough time. Or someone that was a photographer that didn't want to write, I think today has a pretty tough time. But those people that took the opportunity of technology and said, I'm going to make it my tool, I'm going to make it my weapon, I'm going to master a new skill and practice both at a great level, I think those are the people that are highly relevant today and that have grown their skills and their capabilities tremendously. So, for me, I think the, the future is clearly full of uncertainty in our industry uh, and as anything that touches technology. But I also think that the future is not defined. So the choices we make today, next year, in the next five years, the next 10 years will help to shape the path that our industry grows in and that our profession will grow in. The UX design of the 1980s and 90s is very, very different than it is today. And likewise, in 10, 20 years from now, it will look very different. But one thing I do know, the world needs problem solvers, and that is what we do best. So let's get ready, and let's, let's, do, let's amp up our skills, let's empower ourselves and each other and the community with the best insights that we, we have available. Thank you. All right, thanks, Paul. Do we have any questions from the floor? Anybody who's still worried about their jobs? No questions? Do you have questions on Slido? Yes, we do. So I think it's really, really interesting how uh, Paul shared about the skills we need in the future. But I think to sum it up in a one-liner, I think, um, in the future, we just need to be ready to learn and unlearn the skills uh, we already have uh, within the new jobs as the world uh, keeps on changing and our jobs may be changing in the future, right? Yes. Perfect. So, okay, so while we wait for the Slido to be up, are you sure there's no questions from the floor? Relieved, okay, she's relieved. <laughs> All right, so, so the first question, on a personal level, what skills do you hope to deepen or widen in 2019? Oh, that's a great question. I'm practicing a lot of new skills in my current role in SCB. Um, so as I said, it's a 117-year-old bank. Actually, pretty modern, pretty modern organizations actually evolved with the times quite well. But personally, for me, what's really at stake is... Um, on one hand, uh, I think the, probably my biggest focus would be around um, the soft skills in terms of management. So I actually have the great fortune of working with people just one level below the, the bank CEO, which is a bank of 35,000 people. So it's actually it's great access to people um, to have debates, to have discussions about roadmaps, future plans, and so on. But then, of course, Getting them on board or getting them to understand a user-centric vision of the world is not that easy, right? Title does not give you the power. You need to earn the power from your peers. So I think for me, it's, um, it's still building on that, really. And then with the cultural differences involved, being a very Thai bank as well, that's personally for me something, something new to learn, yeah. Okay, so uh, this is my personal question since before we move on. So since you've worked in multiple countries, right? I think Netherlands, US, uh, countries across Asia. 
what do you think of global competence? Like, how, is, how important is it um, in the actual world, especially in Singapore, where, like, we really have a diverse community? How important is global competence? Uh, that's a great question. I think, um, I would say very important. The world is getting smaller and smaller because of technology, right? And more and more people are traveling, more and people are working overseas, but even for people that are not, I think our involvement with the rest of the world is bigger. Um, and if I look at my team in, in, in Thailand, in Bangkok, for example, although the university system is not really geared up to UX professionals um, and that kind of specialism that much, courses from Udacity or Coursera are really, really readily available. And they're not that expensive. And it actually changes the ballgame a lot. But that does require them to say, hey, one, I speak enough English to be able to access those courses. And two, I'm open-minded or outward-facing enough to learn from the rest of the world and, and learn from peers and experts within, but also have that outward view. I think both are really, really important. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we have more questions on Slido. So, one, um, advice for a company which UX maturity is unrecognized. So, if the level, uh, top level management it doesn't really recognize the importance of UX, what's your advice to them, to the people working in those kind of companies? Right. Well, to my personal interpretation of the model, unrecognized probably means they don't have a UX role or perhaps it's a UX person that's kind of wearing multiple hats. So maybe it's a business analyst that also wants to do some UX, but there's not a dedicated team yet. I think for those companies, it's very, very early stage. So I think it depends on the size. Maybe if it's a very small, if it's a smaller startup, say like 20, 30 people, I think you can help to shape, build the awareness and be that UX team of one and evangelize and bring more awareness, build the relationships. If it's a larger corporate and you're at the I lost the word, the, uh, that, that, that level where there's a bit less support, I think it's a tough, tough call. Yeah. So evangelize and get your bosses to know that this is important. Mm. All right, so uh, next we have an interesting question as well. As head of service design, how would you say design thinking and service design are different or overlapping? When would you choose to use them? Please share an example, oh. if possible. This is the, the never-ending debate I have with my own team as well, of course. Oh, wow. Well, but even between design thinking and UX design and, and, and other interaction design, as an industry, we love to come up with new terms frequently, which in some ways is helpful, in some ways is confusing for everyone involved. Personally, um, I look at I look at frameworks and methodologies at, at a conceptual level and I say, okay, well, a lot of them are really about building feedback loops to say, hey, try and test something quickly and easily, such as with a wireframe or a prototype, right? Validate it, either with quantitative or qualitative data, get some results, make some changes and repeat. At the highest level, that's kind of what we're doing, right? We're doing that in different areas, on different platforms, in different contexts, but that's sort of what, we, what we're really doing. So, yeah, I think for me, in terms of, let's say, service design versus UX, it's a heavy debate within my own team as I have people doing both, and it's a young market for doing both. Uh, I think coming from London, I had the fortune of working with some people from agencies like Fjord, very famous service design companies, and the way I look at it is really, it's a different focus. It's, a say, it's, it's roughly the same skill set and mindset Right, it's understanding user needs, understanding the business objectives, and then going through that process of validation and testing. But in the context of, for example, SCB in the bank where I work, the service designers are more focused around um, projects in the branch, where physical environment plays a much more powerful role. Right, so if we're redesigning a iPad application where a user, a customer can walk up and self-service um, some, some frequent task, it's not just designing the interface and the UX of that interface, but it's how do you walk into the branch and how do you know where to go in the branch? And how do we encourage people to move to self-service rather than the counter? Um, and then testing and processing and prototyping that in addition to the actual interface itself. Yeah. So the choice between um, UX design or service design depends on the business case and the nature of the business you're in. Yeah, correct. I mean, to blow it out wider, you could argue in some businesses, mm -hmm. 
the output of service design may not be a layout or an interface or, or, or UX design at all. Maybe it's a different proposition or business model. But more frequently than not, I think it's a bit more tailored down towards those types of outputs. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Um, so this is a very interesting question with 12 likes. So in hiring for UX roles, what are the top soft skills you look for in candidates and how important are they in the context of the future of design? Oh, okay, wonderful. So for me, presentation skills, communication skills are, are absolutely critical. So um, earlier this afternoon, there was a mention of, uh, of someone called Mike Montero. Uh, great guy, They're really, really funny, really funny guy as well. I uh, encourage you to look him up. He has a great talk where he basically goes on a big rant about uh, him as an agency owner, design agency owner, what are the things that he looks for in his designers? And you know, one, kind of one of the things that comes out is a designer is only worth their ability to convince a stakeholder of their design. In other words, if a designer comes up with a beautiful solution, but cannot get product owners on board or business analysts on board or senior management on board, then really their, their output is, is limited to some, to some extent, right? So the people that can take that proactive approach and, and try really hard to pitch their work and to get people bought in is really, I would say in some cases, some businesses, half of the equation. It's half hard skills and it's half the other soft skills side. Okay, um, I think that's pretty clear. Okay, so I wanted to stop, but then an interesting question popped up. Uh, so you were talking about like not so much being jack of all trades, like being a unicorn is not so much of being a jack of all trades, but it's more about like knowing a bit of everything. So there's this question, based on data or trend, will the future need more generalists or specialists? Oh wow, making predictions is always, uh, is always tricky. Yes, it is. Uh, I think the easiest answer would probably be both. The reason I say both is if I think back to the media industry, right? So, again, did journalists or photographers, did they go out of business from one day to the next? No, right? But it becomes an increasingly competitive playing field where young graduates or, or younger professionals are able to, um, to get up to speed and a similar level of competency much faster than previous generations. And I think the same is true for our profession, right? Access to content before five, 10 years ago, yeah, you need to maybe go abroad, study a bachelor's or a master's in Europe, US or somewhere else, spend a lot of money and time. Today, you can sit on your sofa and do Coursera in your evenings, even throughout high school, right? You don't even need to wait until you finish high school which is great, and that's gonna empower a huge generation of new people to get smarter and sharper, but that means for us that have been in the industry for a while, we need to stay on our toes as well, make sure we're on the cutting edge, right? And we can't get too, too relaxed, we need to keep investing in ourselves. So I think if we become too specialized and the industry shifts, our specialism may not be as relevant anymore, and that's a, that's a factor to think about. But if you're too much of a generalist, you're too easily replaced by a robot or, or by someone else. So I think, yeah, the, right, the answer so lies in the middle. Need to have, find a balance between all the skills. All right, so um, last one, last chance. Any questions from the floor? No? Okay, this one. Um, when you showed your slides regarding the evolution of designs from like the, com the control panel of the airplane to uh, up to iPhones, the, uh, it means that user experience design was, existi uh, was existing way, way, way back. But now it seems so very, very popular that everybody wants to venture on it, even businesses and banks. Do you think that social media or the internet or like um, played a big role to make it really popular now, uh, nowadays? Mm. A great question. I think just to start, maybe I think the using the example of the cockpit, right? I think that's where at the time maybe there's more people in an ergonomics profession. I think they were not maybe UX designers the way we think of them today, but they're very much trying to solve similar problems, right? So I think the names have changed over, over the decades, but yeah, same fundamental problems. In terms of your question around the popularization, 
Um, uh, there may be a different point of view on this. For me, um, I was working in London for seven years before shipping out to Asia. And around 2007, 2008, when the iPhone came out, actually it triggered a huge change in the industry in London. So, so London's actually doing a lot of the re big regional UX work for multinationals in Europe. And sort of the year following the launch of the iPhone, suddenly businesses were like, wow, design sells. Design can be a differentiator, it can be a, a way to stand out in a crowded marketplace, can help us get a competitive edge. And in the current kind of two or three years following, that had a huge impact in the amount of work and the demand for UX professionals. So I think from my perspective, I would say successes like that have kind of launched design to the forefront. Yeah, and I think that's a great opportunity and a great place for us to be. But of course, we need to work hard to keep it that way. Yeah. Thank you. All right, thank you, Paul. Um, can we give him a round of applause?